Hi and hola everyone. I don't want to put a timer because I tend to talk a lot. So I'm going to show myself at 25 minutes. So we can review where we are and see if we're going to kick off our conversation from there. But I should keep talking. We'll do that with some level of democratic exercise. Yeah, so I'm going to put the start. Okay. So uh, thank you, Larry and Vivek. This is great. I'm very excited of being here. We have been talking for a while. We have engaged actually in the context of these days on uh, several issues around uh, technology and human rights. So I'm very excited of uh, the opportunity to talk you know, with some of you and uh, learn uh, those things that uh, you guys are interested in or those things that I should be interested in. And in a way, see what you guys think of my and our perspective uh, on what is going on at the intersection of human rights and technology. Uh, feel free to stop me at any time. I want to use some slides, but to be very honest, I'm just going to use them as my guide to make sure that I talk about the right thing at the right time. Uh, if, the, if there's anything that I mentioned that is too jargon, and I don't think that's going to be the case, please stop me. If there's any question, please do it. If you have a correction, then wait. So, um, who I am. Um, as Larry said, I am Enrique Pirases. I have been working at the intersection of technology and human rights. I would argue for more than 10 years. Uh, in a more formal way, I have been doing it for the last 10 years. Before that, I have been doing stuff uh, around environmental justice, uh, reproductive rights, gender identity, and others. Uh, and I'm saying that because one of the things that is interesting of the time to live is that the monolithic understanding of human rights has uh, changed, has uh, rapidly and suddenly, in a way, changed. 20 uh, or 25 years ago, if you mention to anyone uh, the notion of human rights, it's quite likely that the first understanding of it would be something related to transitional justice, perhaps, or some violent conflict, or perhaps just torture directly. Today, it's quite likely that the vast majority of us have you know, different tags and labels that are more complex and that represent a greater diversity. Think of LGBTI or LGBTQ, depending on how you take a look at the space, environmental justice. Uh, think about issues related to language and the loss of language in certain spaces. You know, or access to the right to access to information, and particularly the right to privacy. So, it, and that's why I am is important because I think that one of the things that I want to share with you is a perspective on some of these issues that continues to evolve. In the same way that you guys are being exposed to a great deal of knowledge, as a human rights practitioner, I continue to be exposed to an ever-changing environment. So that is, in a very honest way, the who I am. Now, the who do I work for, for real? There's nothing undercover. I work for Benetech. And Benetech is a very interesting organization. It's a company, but it's a non-profit company that has been based in the Silicon Valley since its birth. And Benetech has been working uh, on issues of, generally speaking, rights for around 25 years, and mostly around issues of uh, disabilities or global literacy. And that over the last 10 years has also uh, worked on very specific aspects of human rights work. Uh, Benetech has uh, is mostly known for the development of software that facilitates the documentation effort, the secure and effective documentation of a human rights abuse testimonial and evidence. So I work for them. That is more or less what I'm, from what I'm going to try to talk to you today. Now, more specifically, and what is Martus, I think I'm going to start to use the slides, because I tend to do this a lot, the, the mistakes, not the presentation. Uh, Okay, so Martus, in a nutshell, and again, this is not going to be a sales pitch. I have to warn you that Martus is free and open source. So, uh, but Martus is an information management and data collection framework uh, that is, as I said, free and open source, and that provides end-to-end, -end, actually, particularly client-signed end-to-end uh, crypto, which is an issue that I will try to come back uh, to. And just, and I understand that probably most of you are familiar with some of this. Uh, I'm just going to go through it, just in case. I'm pretty sure that many of you know more potentially than I do on this. So, in a way, Martus could be understood as a system, as a, a server for your cipher text. And what I mean with that is that, uh, as a piece of software, one of the things that Martus does is that it transforms the records, uh, the text and multimedia uh, records of human rights abuse, uh, you can think of them as interviews perhaps, into cipher text, something that is not accessible for anyone else but the right uh, recipient. Um, I'll explain some of this later when it's less about Martus and more of the space, but an interesting uh, aspect of Martus is not the crypto per se, 
is for how long the crypto is thought for. And without going into any cryptographic debate, which is nothing that I'm capable of sustaining, uh, I would argue that another important quality of the way Marx is, uh, has been trying to work is around preservation. As you can imagine, information is, if not the most powerful, one of the most powerful assets for the human rights movement. And in that sense, the preservation of information for future use is quite critical, either because it may become a, an asset for a, a legal endeavor, for public advocacy, or for memorialization. Um, I, another particular and interesting thing of the what we do is that we provide software that allows organizations to work in a distributed manner, you know, for someone to be able to collect records remotely without losing the ability to protect that data in transit, address, etc. I'll stop slowly my self speech. Uh, but I, I think it's important that you know when, that when I speak institutionally, when I try to speak at Venete, I try to do as best as I can. Uh, I try to bring the, the experience that the organization has had in a bunch of countries. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that sense, many of the things that you are going to hear from me are very biased by this experience, you know, by working in these spaces in a particular set of rights. Uh, now, going back to what we are supposed to be talking about, hyper, uh, hyper rights in the age of human surveillance, that would be interesting. Uh, human rights in the age of hyper surveillance. So, as I said, there's certain things that are very interesting. I briefly mentioned the notion of, you know, the changes in the notions of human rights, which I think is not minor, no? What I, I guess I was trying to say with the break of the monolithic understanding is that the space of human rights is larger, you know? And in one way, we, one could argue that size may cause chaos. You know, there's more things on the space, which is going to be not a minor thing. The, the times that we live are times that are quite, quite unique. I think that probably we all, probably we all know we perceive that we're going through severe societal changes. Uh, uh, when we think about you know, our ability to produce and collect information, uh, when we think our ability to produce certain types of information, uh, consume information at an incredible speed, access massive amount of information, there's a great deal of things that have been uh, uh, affected, created, destroyed. You know, this area, this city in particular, has been actually at the core of most of that transformation, for good and for bad, uh, depending on what company you visit. Uh, but overall, has been uh, a large responsible. Many of us, uh, early in the days before surveillance was the topic, bought rapidly into the opportunity of technology. Uh, we even rapidly jumped into the notion that there was a digital divide that had to be broken, had to, so that had to be a bridge, because uh, technology uh, brings great opportunities for the advancement of society. You know, many of us became rapidly optimistic. Uh, uh, rapid utopians of the use of technology. But like many other things that involve societies, you know, there's many sides to every story. And technology in particular uh, was rapidly uh, transformed into a tool of surveillance. Um, let's see. So how many of you who is, know, know who is Bruce Schneier? I do. But Bruce Schneier is it's a pretty interesting person. But he is, in a way, uh, is a voice of uh, reason in a sea of insanity. That's my wife, after all, by the way, they share uh, titles. But the interesting thing about Bruce is that Bruce is a, not only a, a very sophisticated uh, technologist, but he's also a very sophisticated uh, person that is able to understand surveillance in a very complex way and has become a voice for some of his concerns. Uh, Bruce has said, and I think that this may echo some of the things that you have read or hear, that the internet is a surveillance state. And whether we admit it to ourselves or not, and whether we like it or not, we're being tracked all the time. And I think that probably for most, many, or some of you, this is something that is not that surprising. I think that maybe some of you have seen some weird activity on your email, many of you have questioned, you know, how it's possible that so much information is known by your browser, etc. There may be different ways that you have seen this, but I'm pretty sure that most of us, many or some, <laughs> have at least uh, perceived some of this. Um, what I think is interesting is that quite a bit of this, quite a bit of this uh, capacity of surveillance 
it's not just created by technology. Technology is not a thing. It's not a you know an entity that has lived there in a cave and suddenly has come out really angry to eat us all. Technology is something that we have created, and in many ways, the capacity that governments, in particular, first what organized crime, have to surveil what we do, comes up out of our own actions. I remember using this example, and to be honest, I don't know if I read it or if someone told it to me or if I just completely invented it. But the way I tell it is that someone <laughs> told me <laughs> that, uh, and again, uh, that someone was very surprised about what we do today with Facebook. Like, this is a person that, I, I just remember who it was. <laughs> I cannot mention him, but anyway, he's a Russian man. Uh, and he's an Ukrainian man. He would be very offended if you called him a Russian today, particularly. Uh, but back in the day, he was a Soviet. And uh, one of the things that he told us uh, before he retired, actually, was that he was super angry and upset and confused at the why we were using Facebook so much if this is the type of information that the KGB will extract to you. Like, where were you last night? You know, who are your friends? You know, what do you think about the political party? Right? This is the stuff that we put out there for free. Right? And we put a massive amount. All of us, and we even put the changes of that discourse. Many, many, many of us may change our perspective on politics, on soccer. I assume of you all like soccer. <coughs> even those changes in perception are now possible. Are, are now possible. So it's very interesting that a lot of the capacity from the surveillance state that Bruce is talking about actually, you know, come back to us as responsible. Um, so there's another interesting thing. What I said, I believe, is true. And I want to call each one of us responsible for any damage that may come our way. That said, and unlikely for us, we don't control the whole space. One of the interesting things that, in my opinion, happens uh, from the excessive use of uh, technology, the technology that you use all the time, is that in the process of its use, we create what several people have called a digital chat. Even, in, even when you may be OK by submitting the where you were you know, last night, you may not know that actually you were submitting way more than just the text, the picture that you used to describe such event. You are actually moving with you an incredible, a very complex picture of the things, the space that you have moved on. And in many cases, it could happen, or could be think as a, as a continuum, as a movie that is being filmed while you live, which is starting to be pretty creepy. Pretty creepy. It's like, you know, that terrible movie with Jim Carrey, but, you know, for each one of us without the luxury of, you know, the protection of an environment. Uh, so the digital shadow is not a minor thing. It happens when we travel, you know, every time that each one travels. Uh, and uh, it also gives us the ability to, you know, uh, given how sophisticated the technology for your on understanding of structure and structured data is, to create complex relations that we can even understand. So it is quite likely that a behavioral marketing agency knows more about you than you or your mom or your cat. It is quite likely that they may know about your own preference, the likelihood of you to like something that you don't know. And that starts to get very worrisome when it's about surveillance. There's also something very interesting around the digital shell that we create. And this is a small example that is a bit of a forced example in the sense, uh, but I think that it's important. In many ways, ways, the digital shadow that we create is not only a potential risk because the actor that is in charge of collecting that digital shadow decides to sell it, decides to give it to a government, or is uh, forced to provide to a government, or is simply uh, robbed of the information by a government or the organized plan. In many cases, mistakes happen. Some people make mistakes. I was young, I made a mistake once, and then uh, I married. Um, one of the things that is interesting about this is that this is a document that contains, I am uh, from Chile, technically, uh, and in Chile we use, uh, in the same way that you use IDs and passport, we use a particular ID. We call it root, R-U-T, or a cellular identity. Each one of us get assigned a number. And it's a very private number, pretty much like your social security. You can do a lot of things with that if you are interested in, you know, something relatively criminal or subversive. But um, the interesting thing is that this is a document that was created in the context of a very cool effort. This is part of the list of people that were they need, tortured, or disappeared in the Pinochet stage. And uh, uh, 
in the process of that documentation, many people collected all of this information and what and the document was released as public information. My, uh, my mom is in this list. My mom is alive. I'm very lucky. Uh, but uh, my mom's data is there. And I came across this document when I was looking for something absolutely different. And I realized that a lot of my mom's information was there. So it is very interesting that it's not that everything has you know, a direct responsible or there's like a, a human machinating someone. You know? We made mistakes. So the digital shadow also you know, is risking that sense. Um, now, who knows what is this? Or supposed to be? You can guess, it's fine. <coughs> it's not Disneyland, and it's definitely not Palo Alto. And it was not Palo Alto. Where they hold the servers that store cloud? That's Utah, right? Exactly. Yes, this is Utah. I didn't hear what you said. They, it's, they have servers in those buildings that hold all the information on the cloud. Yep. This is what we believe. This is, we believe it's a picture, it's an early picture of the data centers that the NSA was trying to build, the team build in Utah. The interesting thing about it is not that if the picture is true, to be honest, is that we now know that there is actually a very, very, very quantified effort to increase that capacity by many, many exits. You know, this we estimate to be one of the largest investment of data centers from the government. We don't know what's happening there, unless you guys have clearance that I don't have. You know, we, but we can speculate. Some people that are very smart are able to speculate you know, the potential com uh, consumption of electricity and thus the potential number of uh, uh, computers or processing units that may exist. But we know it's big. We do know it's going to be very big. Now, so if what is going on today is already pretty, pretty creepy without this thing being turned on, one can only get just very worried about what's coming up. Especially because the stuff, if you believe in, if, if some of the stuff that has happened in the past is a mix of the result of our own mistakes and negligence of others, what could happen when you know, the concerted effort to do this, the planified and well bodied effort becomes more standard? In, I am trying to scare you, I guess. So it is very interesting that we think that this is kind of like me. I show you the Utah Center and I scare you and I tell you it's terrible and it's happening right now. The really crazy thing is that this is something that has been happening as all the surveillance, right? Uh, governments have tried somehow to repress the same, right? Uh, does anyone know what is this? This is a lovely picture, to be honest. This uh, is uh, a room in an AT&T center in San Francisco, in a street called Folsom Street. This uh, picture represents the room 6418, which is a room where a whistleblower uh, let us all know that a significant hack to the internet was going on. Basically, and again, I'm not an electrical engineer uh, or anything related, but what basically was going on is that the NSA, now we know, was trying to split the internet at one of several main massive mm -hmm. This gave it back then, this is back then, this is almost 10 years ago, if not more, the ability to take a copy of all the traffic that went through there. Now, I'm saying that, with, oops, sorry, sorry about that. So, it is interesting in that sense. Of course, we do not who did it. Edward Snowden, former NSA contractor. One of the interesting things is that there's a lot of information that we have been acquiring over time around the state of surveillance. Uh, but it's not until now, thanks to the courageous revelations of Edward Snowden, that we have significant and incredibly technical evidence of what things go on. You probably have heard about you know, some of these randomized insane names that the NSA has provided to its program. You know, I think that acid fault or false acid, uh, it, it is, it is up to a point, kind of point. But the interesting thing is that each one of them, and there's hundreds of them, represents a very well funded and planned surveillance exercise. So it's interesting then, in that sense, oh, I should have switched that to English. Apologies for that. What this says is that paranoia is not for crazies anymore. I remember, and again, I am definitely not in the deep, deep paranoia space. I have friends, and you probably have friends that are way deep there, you know, people that are very angry or upset or just gave up. But I remember talking to colleagues in the human rights space about, you know, what we learned from Folsom Street. Let me check, do a time check. Uh, 
about what we saw in Folsom Street. And I remember, you know, speculating and saying to people, look, if this is happening, there may be these severe consequences. It may mean that when you and I exchange an email about uh, an information source that is telling us that the Cambodian government is confiscating land and is the president cousin who is doing it, it may be that someone is collecting that name, right? That may be possible. And I keep you know that people call me crazy. I do remember instances where people literally asked me to produce my team foil hat. Mm -hmm. Hmm? Interesting enough, I mean, it doesn't matter, but I told you. And uh, so in that sense, we have sufficient and significant evidence to advance the conversation and know that paranoia is not for crisis anymore. So, but let's leave you know, Snowden and the US government and the NSA behind. Because as you may know, the US government is not the only government in the world. And it's definitely not the best and not the worst. Hmm? So this is already an old map. Do you, any of you know what it is? It says there, so I hope you cannot read so you can pretend. This is an already old map of the potential uh, customers for Finn Fisher. Has any of you heard what is Finn Fisher? Finn Fisher, I would say from a software perspective, is a beautiful set of systems. Finn Fisher is one of the components. But it's basically a set of uh, programs that allow, ones that install, allow the, the owner or operator to absorb anything that happens in that machine. It's called malware, malware human speaking. And the way Finn Fisher operates is quite interesting, but the very interesting thing for the purpose of this map is that, of course you see the states, right? But you see a bunch of other countries that are kind of weird, like, I mean, I thought it was the NSA. This is already out of date. I can tell you that, based on my conversations with some of the people in this space, this map has at least doubled the code. So you see places like Ethiopia. I thought Ethiopia was in a constant economic crisis. How can they afford surveillance? Uh, you see places, you know, like Indonesia. Uh, think of Brunei or Singapore. Like the, the notion of surveillance being just exclusively deep is incomplete. It's also very wide and it's continued to spread. Hmm? And in that sense, this is where I come with the fear of hyper-surveillance. It's not that someone can do complete surveillance on each one of us. It's that it can happen almost everywhere. If it starts, if one could write like a script for a movie, start to become kind of like this gelatin that starts to cover the whole thing, right? It's pretty, pretty scary. Um, and you know what's scary about it? It's, it's not even just this. It's that it's getting so cheap. It is getting so cheap. Think about this uh, surveillance beacons that we all carry. Uh, even if it's a future phone, as we were talking this morning, if you have one hundred dollars, actually nine, this is already old. I bet it's cheaper today. This is a year and a half old. You can buy for a hundred dollars or less a device that lets you extract all the information of your system. If you ever want to do it, I suggest you do it. You get ridiculous amount of information from that tiny thing. Your log of calls. And the interesting thing is not that someone can do it for a hundred dollars. The police actually are starting to do it. If you get in trouble in Auckland, in a big protest, some police may ask you for your phone. You know, one of the things that they may be doing, a bit more complex than this, but it's in that line, is that when you do this, you also know what they are being, what is being logged. It is crazy. It is really, really crazy. And the cost is very important. Let me just move to the next slide. Um, sorry. This, going back to the Think Fisher and uh, the software provided by a company called Gamma, this is a pretty sophisticated piece of software that costs, I'm gonna argue, and I don't know the full list pricing, it's something that may cost around $100,000 for a national <coughs> level implementation <coughs> with a few targets. Again, it sounds like a lot of money you're an individual. Uh, for a government, even of a small size, is nothing. So the capacity, you know, the, the um, uh, the weaponization of this software has made it really, really cheap. And again, that is very concerning. I'm not going to put play on this video, but uh, one of the ways that we see this uh, increasingly relevant is that we see them creating ads. You know, the same way that code creates an ad for us to buy something in the Super Bowl, you know, these malware companies are, you know, selling to governments in the same way that you sell Nike shoes. 
this is another example of something that I did this. I did I did, this is I own these two things, and you should test them if you can. Each one of them is around a hundred bucks. Uh, this is the type of thing that you can. This is an open source uh, router or has been open, I guess, <laughs> and that's an Ajagi antenna. With this, I did a test in New York. I don't think I am liable for it in any way, but I did something, you know, pretty. Fine. I connected that device and I decided to scan a building that was two miles. Oh, I'll extend myself. I'm gonna do my two more minutes. And um, I scanned a building that was three miles away from me, just out of technical curiosity. You know what I ended up doing? I realized that half of the Wi-Fi was either open or breakable. I had loaded a small, very easy to operate software that can break cheap crypto. And I realized that it's actually quite easy to get in on something. It's quite easy, it's quite easy. So even when all of this is expanding, we are taking very little care. <laughs> if there's more and more technology and our understanding and our actions to prevent it do not move at the same speed. I think, I hope I convince you that the speed of surveillance it is such that makes our, the speed of our understanding of it so small. Uh, I'll try to go deeper into this. Well, this is, I was trying to say how easy it is. You know, this is an old uh, Pringles uh, antenna. But I'll just do Going back to the cost, and why is it important? Because this means that it's more usable by government. This is a graphic created by an independent researcher called Ashkan Soltani. So all credit goes to him. And this shows the cost of surveillance. Uh, going back to the Facebook uh, point that I made before. So if you want to do, uh, perform a cover operation, you know, again, do that. Hmm? Back in the day, one of the things that you will do is that you will task a bunch of people to follow you. you know, and try not to be seen and the switch. There's a whole set of literature about it. It's pretty exciting. But that has a great cost, $270. This is an estimation for this graph. Once that you start to see you know, other means, you can go, let's go rapidly. You know, if I want to do the same thing and try to track with the same result, now it may cost me many, many, many times less, 53 times less to do this with information that you voluntarily provide uh, to your uh, cell provider. So um, anyway, let me just break that part and start to talk a little bit about the, what I have learned. I spent too much time on that. Um, so I, I hope you, you understand what, when I come when I use the term hyper surveillance. So in that sense, as a human rights practitioner that has a very biased experience, I, I hope I was able to explain the what I'm talking about. I am highly concerned around some of the implications, the ethical implications of both the use of technology in the context of human rights, as well as the ethical implications of our negligence to continue to understand technology with or, with the, or outside the human rights context. So I, I want to show you one example of um, something that actually doesn't look technologically mediated what your technology could have actually gone a long way. I'm not going to, and I have to confess, I'm not an expert in law. I'm not an expert on the project that I'm going to show you, so I'm going to use it just as a reference. Uh, how many of you are familiar with something called the Belfast Project? Okay, that's good, because then you cannot call me up. <laughs> but the Belfast Project is a project that came out of an American university, in Boston in particular, and that in a simplistic way, and please understand that I'm in no way able to fully represent the scope of the project, try to do uh, uh, ethnographic research in a way uh, around uh, the troubles, which is you know, the civil war in Ireland. One of the things that they did, which is not uncommon when you engage with subjects in the context of academic research, for example, is that you go and tell them that you may have been approved by an and that what you will do is the right thing. I'm going to interview you, and I'm going to do the best I can to protect the data. I may tell you, as they did, uh, that I would never publish what you're telling me until you have that. You know, because what you're telling me may, may be self-incriminatory. And most academics are, you know, have high ethical standards. You know? So in this case, these academics came back, you know, did their research, did their work, provided the tape, put them in a vault, probably very similar to what Stanford would do, uh, and move on. Well, you know, politics are weird, and time went by, and the Irish Republican became less of an arm and more of a political arm, and they were part of politics. And at some point, someone else in politics wanted to, you know, 
regardless of my understanding of Irish politics, it's very, very small, you know, basically wanted to, you know, reduce uh, or uh, the, the positive reputation of someone in Sinn Féin, which is what, you know, the Republican became. And one of the things that they tried to do is to prove that the main actor has been actually involved in killings, you know, which is not only an attack against the reputation, it may be someday sufficient to do so many things. And they have no evidence of that. However, many of the people that were interviewed because of this project may have provided evidence. So going back to the implication of what we know is the government of the UK, under something that is called an MLAT, a Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty, actually asked the American government <coughs> to produce a subpoena for the university in the States that is not in the regulation of the UK court system to produce that information. And I, I'm going to make this story short because the university actually did something really cool and tried to defend itself really well. But just to make the story short, the interesting thing is that the researchers themselves, the same people that put that promise of anonymity or privacy, had no technical capacity to fulfill such promises. Either because there's legal element, or because they decided to use means of technology that do not allow for that. And I'm going to move slightly toward you know, the what we can do in this sense. So if such researchers have decided, in the context of their increased understanding, or less negative understanding of technology, which again, was not completely available to them, I'm using that just as an example, not effectively, just just something that we learned, so the, the, the research of the future doesn't feel good. If they have used client-side crypto, uh, they may have been in a position where they say, you can get the files, give me the subpoena, here are the files. I cannot give you the key. The university could have said, I just don't have the keys. The keys are somewhere in Ireland. The keys are held by the researcher, who now is in Australia, or whatever. Or the keys actually were given to the person as a way for him or her to protect the information. So the interesting thing is that we need to start to think more about the impacts of technology less as the, you know, someone stealing your browsing activity in real time and think that, you know, the hyper surveillance also has this four dimensional thing. You know, someone can go back and hold your life. It may be your browsing history, but also maybe this other thing, this records that have been created about you. So it gets very complicated. Uh, how are you gonna, if you are a human rights witness, a subject of violence, <coughs> and you start to learn about these things, you know, how am I gonna trust that any of you comes and interview me and tells me that I will be okay in five years? If I start to learn about these things, I may get very scared. And again, I'm a bit paranoid, so I'm thinking of those things as potentially extreme cases, but you know what may happen? That human rights violation get less documented. Again, many of us are trying for that not to happen, I think it's a complex environment. I'm using that just as an example to, you know, put some things in tension. But I think that it's important for us to understand those implications. Both the ethical implications of the ones that document and the ethical implications that our negligence of understanding may have in space. Um, so, and this is important. I am a big believer in technology. As I was back in the day, in terms of like technology is gonna help us improve the space, I think that in this sense, we actually, it, it, it may seem pretty scary, and it may seem that organized crime and governments have the overhead. You know, I, I think if you take a look at budgets, it looks like that. However, you know, technology has been very interesting and, you know, we are not completely unarmed in thinking of the arms race. You know, we do have an opportunity around technology and I tend to be very optimistic. However, and I see this a lot happening in the context of human rights technology conversations, the reality is that technology is, is not gonna solve anything on its own, right? And I'm pretty sure that most of you now understand this. Now, uh, but again, here and there you will find that someone is claiming to have or calling for someone to embed, you know, the silver bullet for something. You know, that, that shield that will save the Syrian refugee. Uh, so, again, going back to Bushnayer, I think that this is, you know, an interesting art to what he has said. If you think that technology can solve your security problems or your problems, well, then you really don't understand technology and you don't understand your problems, which is more important. Um, so, let me tell you a few things. Um, th there's several things that we can do. Like, I think that one thing that we can think of is in creating kind of like uh, experts on uh, the art of digital therapy. Like, all of us to understand what may happen, you know, and be ready to defend each one of us, you know, 
in a, every time to, to create a, a smaller digital channel, you know, to produce less of our information up there, to make sure that when we ask someone for an interview, we actually come back and save that and encrypt it right. There's a few things that we can, we can train each other, we can train others. Learning can go a long way. And I think the context of human rights technology, one of the ways to defeat hyper-surveillance or to mitigate the impact of hyper-surveillance is in training. And this is not minor, because the more we use the tools that we have available, the more expensive this task will be for the other. They have a lot of money. But as again, Rich Nair, this will be my last quote, I promise. They're not made of magic. They are made, you know, there are people that need to be paid, there's electric bills that need to be paid. And that means that the more expensive we do it for them, the less capacity they will have to do some of it. Um, another thing that we can do, uh, and I'm, now I'm going to try to end, is that I don't know how many of you are familiar with the notion of privacy by design. I, again, not an expert on the topic, but I like the, pri the principle. As I understand it, privacy by design is a framework that was created uh, by the privacy commissioner of the Ontario province in Canada. The way I understand it, the way I interpret it, is that privacy, and I would argue security, safety, and immunity, will be better serviced if it's included early in the process of technology design and implementation. And if we think of that in a little bit, if we stress that a little bit and think of uh, uh, society as a system, uh, we could think that if you guys leave school, you know, and carry with you a good notion of security, privacy, dignity, human rights, everywhere you go, you know, you may affect the design of the things you do. Mm -hmm. So I think that, and I say this with, with great conviction, I think that it's not technology that is gonna give us the upper hand, it's actually some of the convictions that you may be able to carry out of the room. And I have seen some of that impact. I have seen people, like Edward Snowden, you know, putting their life and career on the line for some conviction that he might have got, we don't know where. Mm -hmm. So there's great opportunity in that. I'll be very, very happy to talk after this. Benetech is right here, but also we have access to the human rights space. If any of you is interested in learning more, if any of you is interested in criticizing some of the assumptions, we will be very, very happy to, you know, make a bed and see if any of you will leave this rooms and you know become that big you know, thing. Uh, so that is kind of like my initial presentation. I uh, hope you guys have some questions or comments. Or comments.